Pets Ad Life, your guide to the latest in pet trends, products, and the joy of the human-animal bond with Kristen Levine and Chris Bonifati, powered by the American Pet Products Association and Dog TV. And we are back with another Again. wonderful episode of the Pets Ad Life podcast. I'm Chris Bonifati. Joining me, as always is the salacious and studious <laughs> Kristen Levine. Kristen, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I love October. I just love it. It's my favorite It's a great month. month. I got married that month. It's my dad's birthday this month. Halloween is this month. I love I love me some Halloween. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm a big uh, fantasy nerd, so like giving me an excuse <laughs> to get all like dressed up and dissociate for an entire day. You're yeah. are you wearing a costume right now? That shirt is kind of a costume. Yeah, this shirt actually, you know, <laughs> shout out to Josh Viteri, who found me at the end of Super Zoo to hand deliver me this oh exact gosh. shirt because he was wearing it and I said, that's an awesome shirt. I uh. need one like that for my podcast. <laughs> and he, obviously we're at a trade show. He couldn't give me the shirt off of his back, but right, he found right. a way to make it possible later on in the week. So big shout outs to Josh out there. Uh, if you're listening, uh, your shirt <laughs> has finally made it. It's totally my aesthetic. Uh, yeah, but we'll call it a costume. Okay. Yeah, we'll call it a costume. Uh, this sure. week, we have uh, some really great guests for you guys. We're going to be uh, talking about some famous dogs. You know, mm -hmm. as, as And talking sometimes. to a famous dog. Yeah, which is, it, it's tough to get out of them. You know, these celebrity dogs, they clam up. They're, they're, yeah. they're kind of uh, mysterious. They've got an air of mystique about them. They don't want to, they, they want to be vague. They don't want to be Yeah, direct. you have to go through their people. To ask kind of go through their people, and it's just always, you know, I, I hate that. I just want to work directly <laughs> with the talent. Um, <laughs> but we're going to be giving you, as always, a great episode with two guests, two stories, two product recommendations. And at the end of it all, we're going to answer two of your questions. Uh, and I still cannot believe it is October. So <laughs> we're going to work <laughs> straight through that disbelief and uh, start ourselves <laughs> off with some story time. Kristen and Chris present story time. I have a story with a really happy ending today. Okay. So this is a story about two cats who were both uh, in the same animal shelter in Cullowee, North Carolina. One kitty, I think his name is Percy. Percy. <laughs> uh, That's good. Was very, very shy cat. He, had, he spent over 400 days in this shelter. The other kitty is, where is, oh, hold on. Oh, oh, there it is. Winter. The other kitty's name is Winter and was a very outgoing cat. But oddly, even as an outgoing cat, he spent over 500 days in this animal shelter. Well, a couple of weeks ago, both Percy and Winter were adopted together into the same home. And one of the reasons uh, the woman who adopted them chose those two is because, you know, Percy was so shy and Winter was so outgoing. And so she was hoping that they would kind of like that would be a nice balance in the home, that they're not both outgoing and competing for attention and they're not both super shy. So Percy and Winter finally got adopted Um together. And so we wish them the best of luck. And, and I did want to point out that, um, I believe it was winter was brought into the shelter, like I said, over 500 days ago as a kitten and was actually shy as a kitten. And it took some time for him to come out of the shell and he became very social, which, which tells me that the shelter volunteers probably did a really great job of socializing him and working with him. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, sometimes the kittens that are more, you know, outgoing and, you know, vocal are the ones that get adapted first and the ones that yeah. kind of hunker in the back of the cage and are quiet, you know, I guess, you know, visually it might look like something's wrong with them or they're just not very friendly when they really just are probably frightened. So anyway, I'm just super happy to hear that these two cats that have, that have really done some lo a long time in that shelter um, have a home together now. Yeah. And shout out to that shelter staff too. That's a long time to be taking care of an animal in a shelter. Yeah. So. It is. Uh, big it shout is. out to all those volunteers and workers who make stories like this even possible. Mm -hmm. What's your story today? I, I've got a fun one. I've got okay. some controversy in the high oh, fashion world. I've got controversy that. in the high fashion world. So 
uh, this is a story coming out of Roma, Italia, uh, <laughs> and Dolce and Gabbana. Okay. In all their infinite wisdom, have launched a new alcohol-free perfume for dogs called what? A fifth. After a fifth? Domenico Dolce's poodle. Oh, of course. This has caused an uproar. <laughs> <laughs> Which I just think is so funny. So this, this uh, uh, you know, th- 3.4 ounces is going to run you 99 euros. That's 108 freedom bucks for wow. for those of you yeah. who aren't going to do the math. And obviously, <laughs> you know, it's still European Union. They went through all the safe pet cosmetics and all that kind of stuff. All yeah. totally above board. But just because okay. something's above board doesn't necessarily mean it's great. Right. There's a lot of people who are like, you, you shouldn't be doing like dogs – communicate through scent yes and there's a lot of vets uh uh that are essentially they're bringing this uh complaint to the bureau veritas italia um wow that provides it's a publicly held company that provides inspection laboratory verification and certification Certific- certification services mm-hmm. uh kind of like uh italy's better business bureau is a good sure. way to think about it so just this concept that, hey, dogs communicate with scent. If you change the way a dog interprets its scent, you're going to change its behavior. You could right. confuse other dogs. You could confuse dogs that may be around it often or, or chase it at the dog park. The dog might end up using the bathroom in the house because yeah. its sense of scent smell is uh, thrown, thrown off. Uh, and if the fragrance is so overpowering – the, the reason a dog knows you're like coming to the door, sure, it's the sense of hearing, but it's also they smell you coming. And mm-hmm. if that perfume is essentially blocking that sense of smell, it, it could cause confusion. So there's this whole, there's all of this like, <laughs> oh, how much harm could it be versus this group of people like you're ruining animals. And I'm somewhere right in the middle of I'm not spending $100 on dog oh, perfume. <laughs> No, you know, that's why this one didn't make it into product of the week. It's not because of the controversy. Hundred dollars <laughs> for three ounces. Ooh, well, you know I what? love my dog, but not like that. You know what? Uh, this makes me think of though. This makes me think that it, it was. Do you think it maybe maybe it was just a publicity stunt by Dolce and Gabbana to get some? I mean, the product attention? is real. It's okay, real. So, you so they put a lot of a lot of resources into it. Okay. Yeah, but you're right. Like these are Italians we're talking about. And I get to say this as an Italian myself. <laughs> these are Italians we're talking about. They are conniving and they love drama and yes. they will do something well, they got extreme it. just to cause a kerfuffle. Yeah. Uh, so maybe maybe it is just some clever marketing. But either way, I you know, when I was hitting the internet trying to find something to talk about, I saw this and I was like, this is just whoa. <laughs> well <laughs> these people. It is a little it's absurd. I mean if the only reason you would re- you would think to use cologne on your dog is because maybe he doesn't smell good, and maybe you just need to give him a bath. Yeah, or you're just one of those people who really thinks that your dog is a person. True. You yeah, know, true. I, I'm. It's okay to have a personal relationship with your dog, but at the end of the day, they are a dog, right? And they don't right. use the same stuff we use. And I think sometimes we blur that line a little bit and it's like, yeah, it's a dog. Like, you know, I've talked about like dog beer, which is basically just yeah. like bread flavored water. It's just um, kind of fun. The, the, the dog doesn't desire beer. He doesn't really want it. You're doing it for yourself. And I feel right. like this is another animal product where it's like, you're yeah. doing it for yourself. The for dog sure. doesn't really want this. Well, it'll be interesting to hear what happens. Yes, we'll, we will be following this one closely. So <laughs> tune in. Maybe I'll have an update when Dolce and Gabbana gets... Uh, sued at some point. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Beyond the Leash, exploring the untold stories of pet passion and professionalism. All right. Joining us now is Janina Lauren, a distinguished judge at the Westminster Dog Show. And Janina brings decades of experience and a profound understanding of the herding group. She hails from Connecticut and she was born into a family that's passionate about dog shows. And Janina's journey in the world of dogs started out with German Shepherds, but quickly expanded to Belgian Treverans, which she has lovingly displayed on her on her stove behind or the oven behind <laughs> her. <laughs> Since 1999, she's been judging with a focus on the herding group, best in show, junior showmanship, and several working and non sporting breeds. Uh, let's see. Under the Chateau Blanc kennel name, Janina has bred over 200 champions including multiple best-in-show winners and top performer, 
top performance dogs in obedience and agility. Welcome, Janina. Hi, nice to be with you today. Oh, it's great to meet you. You are an esteemed judge, and we, we've got Chris and I have lots of questions for you. But I thought I'd start out with uh, since you know uh, you judge the herding group. Can you give us some examples of herding group dogs so that some of our listeners who are not as you know uh, you know wise we can about just say it group. for Chris yeah. so, because yeah, he okay. doesn't know. Chris, Chris doesn't, doesn't know, know okay. so. Yeah. <laughs> Chris so know. probably the most common two well-known breeds in the herding group are the German Shepherd Dog and Collies, the rough-coated, mm. long-coated ones, and the smooth Collies. And um, the third probably most well-known dog is Queen Elizabeth's Corgis. Oh, so there yeah. are two Corgis in the herding group, the Pembroke Corgi, which is generally a dock tail, and oh. um, the Cardigan Corgi which is a little bit longer coated and a little bit heavier. So okay. um, there are other breeds like my own, the Belgian Tiveran, which um, there are several uh, breeds of Belgians or varieties if you're from around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are other dogs like the Bouvier and the Briard and the smaller breeds like the Sheltie, which is also very popular as a family pet, the Shetland Sheepdog. Gotcha. Um, and the very... Um, Distinct looking Pooley, which is mm. almost typically a corded breed. Yeah. Gotcha. All very uh, intelligent dogs to this herding group. Yes. The uh, herding group is very intelligent. And that's one of, um, I think, the hallmarks of working and herding breeds is that they were meant to serve us for the most part as humans and doing tasks throughout history and to the best that we can in today's modern society, we ask them to do tas tasks mm -hmm. and things to keep their mind active and uh, primarily as a pet dog to keep them out of trouble at home. <laughs> yes. yes, precisely. Yes, a bored, a bored German Shepherd can be, is not a, good. Can be a nightmare. <laughs> Any bored dog is not good. <laughs> So, Janina, when you're judging, what are some of the key qualities you're looking for in, uh, in a herding dog during these events? So, as we talked about, the herding breeds are primarily um, activity dogs. They were meant to do things. Um, and all of those breeds have standards which you're to judge against. That a parent club, which is the host club of that breed, determines what the best German Shepherd is, what the best um, ideal Belgian Tavern should look like, etc. So we judge against a standard. And some of the things that we look for that are common within the herding breeds is functionality, first of all, because they need to have four good legs um, so that they can do their job if that's herding or gathering or driving a herd someplace. Um, and then the other thing is when you look at them, do they look like they're supposed to look like? So if you see four heads of four herding breeds looking over a, a fence, would you recognize that as a German Shepherd or a Belgian Tavern or as a Collie or as a Border Collie or an Australian Shepherd? So they need to have a distinct look that identifies them as what they are. Um, and then are they in condition? Are they in working condition? So if asked, would they be able to go out after they're done showing and actually do what they were bred to do? You know, Chris and I were talking about this before we started the interview. And you know, so Chris and I, they, they often look all the same. So there must be it must be really difficult in your in your role to to, to identify the nuances between dogs that are that to us seem like they all meet the standard, you know, 100%. Right, right. So um, you, it, it can be to the novice eye that you easily get confused between, for example, um, a bearded collie and perhaps a Polish lowland sheepdog, which have somewhat similar colorings, mm -hmm. and an old English sheepdog. And they're all very distinctly different. So... Um, uh, the best thing I could tell someone that's new to the dog show game is pick up a book of dogs. Um, and the AKC has um, the complete book of dogs, and there are probably several out there at the bookstores. 
and look on the internet and look on the AKC site and just go under the herding group or whatever breed you're interested in or group you're interested in of dogs and uh, just look at them and look at the characteristics that might fit with your family or your show goals if you're interested in showing. And so we've got the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show coming up this February and it will be your uh, first time judging the group at Westminster. So um, <laughs> he's made a bit of made a bit of a concerned face there, a little word. Is it, it you know, this is this is the big one, right? Is that is it all at all anxiety in, inducing to be sort of doing uh, this judging uh, at you know at Madison Square Garden? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, when I received the letter and it said that it would be back in New York, um, I guessed it would be back at uh, Madison Square Garden, but I wasn't sure until they actually announced it. And then they announced it, and then I was scared. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> it, was, it didn't sound as intimidating if it was going to be in some of their temporary locations. But now that it's in the garden, just the whole thought of it um, initially frightened me, quite frankly. So, But, but what know, an honor. Yeah, I know. It, it, you know, it's an honor and uh, it's exciting <laughs> and there's so much that goes with it. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to it very much. That Good. What, what type of prep goes into something like this? I mean, obviously you have, you've been judging for years, you know the breeds extensively and yet still there's that pang of anxiety in the back of your head doing this on this big stage so <laughs> right. how are you going to prepare what what are you going to do right. to get ready uh because I, I know you're going to do a great job but, but how are we going to get there <laughs> so yes I, I think all judges when they get to that point put on their game fi- game face that day yes. right. <laughs> and fake right. it till you make it <laughs> right so then all the panic disappears and you're very familiar with what you're doing um so some of the preparation, of course, is personal. You have to, uh, or we're judged late at night, which is uh, in itself very different. And the bright lights and uh, personally, you know, you have to make sure you have uh, your dress and all that works together and doesn't get doesn't get in the way of examining dogs or walking down that long pathway from one end of the breed to the next. Um, and then for actual knowledge, um, no matter how much you read standards, you always read them again because mm-hmm. uh, as comfortable as an individual might be with those, you never know. So standards change. There are nuances that are different. Um, so, yes, I'll be reading standards and um, trying to remember as much of the hallmarks of a particular breed as is possible. So that's what I'm doing to prepare. Very exciting. Well, the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show is going to be held February 8th through 11th back at Madison Square Garden, as you mentioned. And and as I understand, tickets are already on sale. That's terrific. That's terrific. <laughs> get get your tickets now because they're, it's back at the garden. Uh, I expect it to be a an absolute sellout. I, I had the honor of being there uh, last year when it was at Ar- Arthur Ashe. I got to meet uh, a lot of very interesting characters. Uh, there's all sorts of fun people who both attend and show and judge uh, these events. So if we have some listeners out there, Janina, who uh, may be considering uh, starting to show their dog or breeding dogs or or maybe they've been showing dogs, they want to become a judge. Do you have any advice for, for folks who may be just starting out on, on how to get involved at maybe a more local level? Um, yes, because uh, going to uh, the garden is like the pinnacle of success. So it, you work your way up to that. Um, and we all started out locally. Um, yeah. So I can only tell you from my experience, I, I started out in 4-H and then I was in junior handling and then I showed and bred my own dogs. Um, so I would recommend to anyone that um, you go to dog, go to dog shows and watch and just observe and talk to people when they're done showing about what you're interested in. Um, And certainly there is um, an avenue at the American Kennel Club where you can go in and visit with them and you can go on their website and ask questions of experts that are there. 
um, find someone in the breed that you are comfortable with, and that may take a little bit of time um, to find a commonality among what your interests are. And um, just take your time and watch and see what you like. It's not as intimidating as you think. It's, uh, <laughs> some, some people find it very intimidating, but uh, once you get comfortable with how dog shows are run and how it happens, mm -hmm. um, you can fall right into it. And you individually um, can end up being very successful. A, a great number of people that compete at Westminster are are normal, everyday people that own a very nice dog and started mm -hmm. out and have reached the breed level there and have reached the group level. And we've had breeder, owner, handlers uh, when best in show there. So it's totally possible. Yeah. Well, I, and I appreciate you breaking it down for us to make it, you know, feel more accessible and attainable for, for people who might have an interest in, or maybe a dream. Oh, of yeah. A you dog. know, most, uh, you have to think people, you know, they see Westminster on TV <laughs> and some of the larger shows and it's mm -hmm. like, Oh my God, I need sparkles. I need a, uh, I need this. <laughs> well, I you need... do need sparkles. <laughs> Let's be clear. You need sparkles. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the everyday uh, run-of-the-mill dog show is at a fairground for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Yep. So. That's true. Yeah. And, well, uh, we... you know, to echo the sentiment, I've had the opportunity to go to a few dog shows now, and everybody that I've spoken with, whether they were a handler or a breeder or a groomer or a judge, have been absolutely welcoming ready and willing to share their knowledge and answered all your stupid questions <laughs> answer all my stupid questions about you know what makes a what makes a chihuahua an award-winning chihuahua things like that so it, it really is an, an awesome uh space kind of its own little universe that it is until you feel the gravitational pull uh, you may not even be aware it exists. So definitely yeah. check it out at the local web, uh, level. My understanding is you could just go straight on to the AKC website and see see some of this information. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, they um, there are dog shows that are filmed on occasion, and you can just take a look and see what's going on. And uh, the people that uh, do that are also very good at, at explaining yeah. to a level that everyone understands what's going on at the dog and, show. And speaking of filmed dog shows, uh, folks, Dog TV still has that archival footage of the, the old Westminster shows up on their channel. So if you want to see not just... Um, the current best in show, but the evolution of these different breeds and what used to win and what wins now. I found it to be a really cool experience kind of watching some of the, the old uh, clips, even going back to uh, black and white. So that was, that was really cool <laughs> as well. Oh yeah. Those are fun. Yeah. I enjoy watching those myself. So. Well, and if you want to see Judge Janine judging at the Westminster, be sure to get your tickets now. And we're hopefully I'll get to come next year. <laughs> well, maybe I can be there with Chris this time, and uh, we'll we'll come look for you, Janine. Oh, great, Jan that Janina! Would be great. Sorry, Janina. <laughs> All right. Yes, well, that's all the time we have. Janina, thank you so much for joining us. I will definitely be there. We're going to get Kristen up there too, <laughs> and maybe we'll come find you for the the herding group and and uh, get a follow up interview. Oh, that'd be fun. All right. That would be a lot of fun. We'll see you down there. And again, folks, uh, go ahead and buy your tickets. 149th Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, February 8th to 11th at the beautiful, the world's greatest arena, Madison Square Garden. So go ahead and check that out. Jeanina, thanks again for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Bye now. You know, coming out of that, I think we learned a lot. We learned a lot Gosh. from Jeanina, but... I'm still stuck on the fact that corgis are judged next to German shepherds and collies. Like, <laughs> I know. I, like when she mentioned that, I literally instantly opened another tab and I was like, there's no way, there's no way that's a right, thing. And, right, right, right. Well, is that, that absolutely true? These corgis that's are- That's why I asked her to, to share some of the herding breeds because I automatically think, I don't even think of shepherds. I automatically think of like Australian shepherds. As it well, yeah, so, but I mean, they got shepherd in the name, Kristen. Well, I mean, come on. I know, but that's like what I visualize in my head, you know, so. Okay, that's fair. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, speaking of corgis, uh, you know, there's more than one way to become a famous dog. And it's not just, you know, Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. You can also be a famous dog on Instagram. And uh, you had a really interesting interview recently, didn't you? Yes, with uh, Bacon the Corgi. 
Uh, basically, the Kanye West, uh, the old Kanye West, not the new Kanye West, but the old <laughs> Kanye West of Corgis decked out in in the, the shutter shades and a, a, a bacon <laughs> bow tie. I mean, just absolutely oozing swagger. Uh, so it was really cool to, A, meet the dog, but also talk to uh, Bacon's parents. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, play that back for you all now. I'm joined now by John, Ginger, and of course, Bacon, who is feeling mighty frisky, doesn't want to sit down, all excited for the second day of Super Zoo here as we conduct this interview. How are you guys doing today? We're good. Having a good time? That's, That's awesome. awesome. And uh, Bacon is all decked out in all of his swag. I love the glasses. I love the look. What has inspired Bacon's look today? Well, his name is Bacon. There we so go. So we, uh, we love to uh, always be on trend and uh, make him, uh, you can't mistake his name that way. I've had a lot, his Instagram is a little bit different because it's Corgi Club Colton, so a lot of people get confused, and so that way when they're, they, cause they know him as Bacon, so that way, you can't miss this. <laughs> He's got a little mix of bacon and Vegas going on there. You know, if you notice the the uh, sparkle and the bling, he he yeah. he's, he fits the theme. Yeah, there's definitely some sparkle. There's oh, yeah. definitely some pizzazz. Oh, th that is if you can't see that on camera, that's sequenced bacon on the handkerchief. I've never seen anything quite like that. So, how did bacon get his start as a celebrity? Was this always the goal? Did he kind of fall into it? really fell into it we had our um our other dog colton that's why the instagram is Corgi club colton that we lost in 2020 and my john my husband actually started that account i didn't do anything with it i was we ran a corgi club and um just did meetups and then everyone was getting onto instagram thought it was you know something that everyone was doing so i kind of started posting on there and it took off and then when we lost colton um he just picked right up the earth get up baby it was kind of funny because I had to tell her what Instagram was. I said, I started an Instagram for the dogs. And she's like, what's that? Why would I want to do that? <laughs> and so I had to teach her how to use it. And then it was so funny because it, within a year, it just took off and exploded. And she was teaching me how to do it. <laughs> Still is. Oh, yes. Just completely outpacing you as an influencer. Yeah. So what's it like being you know, not necessarily a celebrity yourself, but your dog somewhat having celebrity. Oh yeah, I'm not a celebrity at all. I'm usually <laughs> the one that gets pushed aside and they're like, can you move so that he can be <laughs> better? Yeah, get out of the shot. <laughs> but yeah, we have a lot of fun with it. We've gotten to do some really, really neat um, things and some cool opportunities. And so it's it's a blast. He loves it. He loves people, he loves the attention. Um, and it's just, it's really, really fun to see the smiles that happen. I mean, we've connected with so many people on Instagram that we wouldn't have met otherwise, so I, I love it. Oh my God, you're Bacon's dad. <laughs> like, finally, I have an identity have in this name. world. I can, I can wield this name. I can be yeah, Bacon's dad. Yeah, like, I'll be Bacon's yeah, dad I'll if that's what you dad. want. Yeah, that's great. Are there any particular memories that come to mind? Some, some really special stuff that has happened with uh, you guys and, and Bacon that uh, just really sticks out as like a core memory that you guys have because of uh, the journey you've been able to go on. There, there end up being a lot of them. We, we have a lot of family traditions. So we have different trips and different things that we do with them each year. And and each one of those things is different. It's unique, but it, it it's like it's a, it, its own experience where we're making special memories with the dogs and we look forward to doing it each year. So it's like it almost is it, like it rolls from one thing to the next. I don't even have time to catch my breath and process the thing that it just happened because then we're always on to the next thing so it's a lot it's a lot of fun yeah the, the people that we've gotten to meet we've you know got we love sports we're a big sports family so he's gotten to do stuff with the phoenix suns with the arizona diamondbacks with the rattlers and so it's just he's re recently gotten and he loves corgi racing he doesn't win but <laughs> but he is the most stylish dog there, there. he like is so much outfits, fun with it he, if, if they gave a, a trophy for that he would always win so yeah it's, just, it's the people and everything that we have met has just been so amazing yeah it's important to look good when you're racing i i, I used to run track and that was rule number one was look good rule number two was run fast so i think bacon is doing quite <laughs> well uh, dogs are sort of taking over the internet and I'd say slowly but surely but it's been a rapid growth to their dominance over social media TikTok, and Instagram where do you guys sort of see uh, bacon and the other dogs on the internet where do you see that starting to go as we gr build momentum you know the one thing is we, we've always tried to be really careful with it because our number one goal in doing any of it has always been for these guys to like just live their best life 
and have a lot of fun. So we, we, we've had to kind of just pull back on some of it because you, you get all these brands want to do things and want to partner and want you to work with them. And we always have to just step back and look at it and say, hey, is this in his best interest? Is this something that he wants to do? Because, you know, the goal has always been for them to just live a great life, have lots of great experiences, be able to do things and uh, and, and have fun. So that's always the number one goal is just, you know, be out there with the family and uh, and, and get get a chance for him to just live life and their, their lives are so much shorter than, than ours. So they, we have to fit a lot of stuff into Reasonable very little time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think that, you know, so we've got some more opportunities um, with partnerships that I never would have thought would be out there. And so I think just being very choosy and making sure that you do stuff that we stay authentic, you know, I don't want it to be, you know, that we just sign up with anybody. And so I think that that's your know, number one goal, always keeping, making sure he's staying happy. Authentic Bacon. And where can all of our wonderful listeners follow Bacon's journeys? Uh, we are on Instagram. It's at Corgi Club Colton. At Corey Club Colton. Thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to talk with me Thank for a you. little bit. Thank you, Bacon and Aspen, who's off camera. Thank you, Aspen, <laughs> as well. Uh, and we're going to go back to more awesome pal stuff. And yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Yeah, thank you. Pets add life. So, Chris, I was checking out uh, Bacon's Instagram account, which is Corgi Club Colton. And, yeah. oh, my God, this is beautiful. Uh, are they professional photographers? These I images are stunning. So. I think I think this, like a lot of people, sort of all just kind of fell into their laps. Uh, um, the husband is a storm chaser. We talked a little bit about that in the interview. He goes into yeah. the planes and uh, chases after storms and <laughs> – Bacon's just over here. He's just vibing. Yeah. That's, Bacon is a pure vibes dog. He was so uh, funny during the interview, just trying to like find some comfort in his chair and being held <laughs> and uh, absolutely adorable. I guess I just love meeting uh, dogs like that with such like a big personality. It's, it's addictive. Right. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of great and addictive things. Uh, Kristen, I think it's time for us to head on over to our uh, pu- 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 <laughs> product of the week. So let's go ahead, Ron, play that jingle and we'll get into product of the week. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I got my, my product here and, um, you know, we've been talking a bit on our previous show, we had been talking about um, animal obesity awareness and I gotten this great question from, I believe, Emily about some feeding strategies and things like that. So I found this really cool uh, interact. They call it the Squeak Carrot Snuffle Mat, um, and it is a. They call it a nose work feed game. Hmm. So essentially, it's this. Uh, think of it like a dog bed, big brown okay. dog bed, and then a bunch of holes in it, and these like. Uh, um, stuffed carrots like these fabric stuffed carrots go in to the ground and they've got squeakies in them and stuff like that (laughs) but the holes are so that you could put some food Uh under these carrots it's really great uh for some of these like terrier mixes or other dogs that really just want to dig and tear into stuff if you have a dog that goes outside and starts digging i think this is a great toy for them um, especially maybe, maybe it's raining outside and you don't want to let your digger out cause he's just going to go get into the mud, you can bust this bad boy out. You put some kibble in yep. each of the holes and set it out and just let them figure it out. They got to, I, I, I believe there's some Velcro involved, so it's not, not as easy. They got to kind of work to pull it out and then stuff their nose down in there to find the food. It's just like one of those things. We talk about this a lot on the show about sort of stimulating and animals' natural instinct. So if your dog's natural instinct is to dig, they're yeah. digging for a reason. Some type of survival instinct is, mm-hmm. is getting them to dig, whether they're looking for food or, or uh, trying to get to cooler earth or yeah. anything like that. This is a great toy that's going to simulate that. Uh, have it on Amazon here for $34. Uh, so it's not even, it's really not going to break, break the bank. Uh, it looks abs- it, and it just like looks cute too. Like it really does just like look like a little bed of carrots. So oh, uh, that's going to be my product of the week for this week. I love that. That's a good yeah, one. What do you got for us, Kristen? So I have, I have a product of the week that <laughs> actually was um, the founder jumped in on our super zoo show and tried, you know, to like 
he was supposed to be asking us a question and he weaved in his product. So he, he followed up with me after and he said, hey, I'm really sorry. I was just super excited about my product. So would you feature it on the product of the week? So I, I said I would do that because- You're so kind. I'm so <laughs> kind. And I think it's super cool too, because, you know, as we're, we're, we're in October, I, for, I forget the actual date when daylight savings time ends, but I think it's coming up in November. Um, so it gets going to get darker earlier. And oftentimes we're walking our dogs in the dark or at dawn or dusk, and it's helpful, not only um, convenience-wise, but safety-wise to have a flashlight. So this is called the Doggy Dual. It is a, um, if you're watching on video, it's you know, maybe eight or nine inches tall. It has several really cool features. So first of all, it has a, whoops, see that? <laughs> got a there we five, go. 500 lumens flashlight to, to guide you. That's your a lot of lumens. It's a lot of lumens. And you know how many lumens the average cell phone flashlight has? Only 50. So this is 10 times brighter than your cell phone flashlight. Uh, it's also got like a strobe on it for safety. Um, and then, oops, oh, I just blinded myself. It definitely got, works. <laughs> yeah, it does. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm seeing like bolts of lightning uh it's got carabiners on it it's got a belt yep. clip so you can just hook it onto your belt or or you can even hook this part onto your dog's leash and yeah. one of my favorite parts is the built-in waste bag dispenser uh so that you if you don't you know so you don't forget and you can just unscrew this to refill it and then finally on the side it has another flashlight that has four different modes and this one is cool because um oh i'm, I'm doing this wrong Okay. Anyway, see, we got the red, the red, the red uh, safety yeah. light. High but vis. It, also, it also does a white one. So you can set this down on the ground. You know how when your dog does his business on the grass in the dark and you're trying to find it to clean it up? Yeah. Well, this is, this is designed to set it down on the ground and shoot the flashlight toward the pile so that you can easily clean it up. So anyway, um, it doesn't even take batteries. It, it, you can recharge it with the USB-C cable that it comes with. And um, it's called the Dougie Do-All. So that's, that's awesome. I love how many products are out there now that free up your hands while yes. you're walking your dog. Uh, because when I was living at home with my parents' dog and uh -huh. you'd take the dog for a walk, it was like one hand was on the leash, one hand yeah. was on the poop bags, both, both used and new. And that was yeah. it. <laughs> like that was, you were stuck like that for the 20 then, minutes it would, it would take yeah. the dog to go for a walk. Exactly. Uh, so I, I love this kind of stuff. And yeah, I mean, visibility is a big deal at night, especially. And here's the thing, too. A lot of people think that it's just the nighttime you have to be careful. It's actually mm -hmm. dusk and twilight mm -hmm. is when visibility is the worst, um, simply mm -hmm. because lights aren't as effective in that twilight light. So something True. like a red light kind of hanging off your back, the back of your yeah. belt loop can be an effective uh, safety tool, especially if you're walking your dog somewhere where there might be cars. Yeah, exactly. And, and one last thing, as a woman, I, you know, I like this uh, feature on the end here. Like, hopefully I would never need to use it, but this could sort of be a weapon. Yeah, that's hefty. It like, <laughs> if you, if, right now, if, for those of you listening, Kristen is brandishing thing, that thing towards me, and I, I feel threatened. I'll admit it, I feel threatened. <laughs> Q&A's. All right. We're going to move on and guess what time it is, Kristen. Uh, is it question? Was it Q&A time when we answer your question? It is Q&A time. This time you caught, you caught on this time. We got it. Yeah, it is it time for us to answer your questions. Uh, submitted, of course, on petsadlife.org slash podcast go on down to the bottom of that page you could submit your question right there or if you're feeling as brave as Kristen with a doggy do all in her hand <laughs> you can record a voice memo and you could hear your question played live on this show and we uh, know you have questions so we are here yes. for you so, <laughs> we Chris, are here you know, for you we usually decide in advance who's going to take which question um are we just you just want to just wing it here yeah, I guess wing it. You want me to you want me to hit hit you with one? Yeah, hit hit me with uh <laughs> yeah, hit me with one or one or one of the first couple that we have. Yeah, I, I, I see a question on here that you don't want me to ask, and I I'm not gonna do it. that to you. Okay. I am kind. At the end of the day, I am kind. Because I could ask you this question right now. Oh, no, and you, you could have you could to answer it. But totally I'm throw not me under going the bus. to do that. Instead, <laughs> I'll ask, uh, I got a question here, and I, I feel like you would do 
a a good job answering this question uh, because you share a name with the person who asked Ooh. it. So this is a question from Kristen in <laughs> Sacramento, California. And Kristen asks, my young puppy seems to be overly vocal, especially during training sessions. Mm. Is this a sign of frustration? And how can I effectively communicate with him to reduce barking without discouraging his enthusiasm? Ooh, that's a good question. From my sister in name, Kristen in Sacramento. Thank you so much for that. Um, so puppies barking, um, a common challenge. And you're saying he's he's especially doing it during training sessions. So that makes me think he's Attention-seeking. Um, typically, training sessions. I'm, I'm going to assume this is a group class or something. You know, where maybe there's are several. There are several dogs, and he's, you know, overstimulated and perhaps just wanting your attention. So that could be what's causing it. Uh, the other thing too is um, if you're if you're inadvertently rewarding his barking, that's not going to help you at all because if he starts barking and then you immediately go to him and say, oh, stop barking, and you're just like getting in his face and giving him that attention that he's seeking, you are actually rewarding um, and reinforcing that behavior. So I would say, and this is going to sound um, easier said than done, but but I know it works because I've done it with previous puppies that I've, that I've had. Uh, first of all, you want to reward him when he's quiet. So if he's barking, um, I would ignore him and ideally turn your back on him. And he, sometimes it might take a while, but as soon as he stops barking, you know, give it a beat, a second or two, and then immediately reward him and tell him what a good boy or girl, or good boy or girl he is. Uh, so you want to reward when he's doing the behavior you like and kind of ignore the attention he's seeking when he's barking. Um, and I'm thinking too that if he is in a group training environment, it could just be the, the overstimulation, um, especially if he's a younger puppy. So you might try some one-on-one -on -one training um, or after class, go outside or go to your home and like sort of go through, you're supposed to practice anyway, right? After class. So um, kind of go through that with him on his own where he might not feel like he's in such a competitive environment. So hopefully that's helpful, Kristen. Uh, that's some great stuff. I wish I had something to add, but you were so <laughs> exhaustive with your answer. You're, so, you're, you're <laughs> such a professional uh, that I'm at a loss. So uh, we're just going to go ahead and say that between two Kristens, we're going to have our answer. <laughs> Alrighty. So Chris, do you have, uh, do you want to give any hints to what question you would like? Yeah, no, you can give me the question that you were dreading. Okay. I think, think I have an question. answer for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, super. All right. So this one's from Juan in San Jose, California. Juan says, I recently set up a freshwater aquarium and I've noticed that my fish seem less active and are hiding more frequently. Could this be a sign of stress? And what are some of the ways to create a more comfortable environment for the fish? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And right off the bat, yes, uh, hiding fish is usually like the number one sign of stress. Um, and it's kind of funny to talk about stress in fish uh, because it's like, you know, I feel like as people, it's easy for us to tell when a mammal is stressed out, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing some of the same things like a dog with anxiety, cat with anxiety. We can see it, but what's a fish with anxiety look like? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, hiding for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. If they... If fish are getting the zoomies, that's actually a sign of anxiety. Uh, fish do because that? It, yeah, they'll they'll dart back and forth cool. across the aquarium. Okay. But the only time fish really swim at max speed like that is when they think something's trying to eat them. Uh, so mm, that's yeah. a, a sign of a sign of stress. Makes, um, if they're scraping across the ground, that could either be stress or some type of uh, 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 skin scale infection. Um, and if obviously if they're not eating their food, something's wrong. Right. Uh, so now we, we've said, okay, the fish is stressed. Well, the reason a fish is stressed, it, it's again, it's different mammals. It's usually like something mental, right? That we got to kind of work through. I'm sorry to say this about, I'm going to say it, it's brave, but it's true. Fish don't have big brains. Okay. They don't, <laughs> they don't experience emotion the oh, way that hear we from the experience fish. emotion. So we're using this word stress, uh, and it is a good word because what really what is stress other than our uh, environment being uncomfortable, right? Whatever position we're in, we're currently not comfortable. And it's the same with fish, but it's much more literal. Their <laughs> environment is not comfortable. So 
A, make sure the temperature of your water is where it needs to be. Uh, even a few degrees below or above is going to change the behavior of your fish. Make sure your water is getting oxidized properly. It's getting enough oxygen. If you see like your fish starting to surface every now and again, that's a bad sign. It means there's not, not enough air filtration going through your tank. Um, obviously hiding places, uh, fish like to have little spots where they could go get away from, uh, prying eyes. Uh, and also if you have just added new fish into your tank, that, that could be a, a cause for issues as well. Uh, guess, you know what eats fish? Other fish. Okay. Uh, so when you introduce new fish into the environment, even though there may be no natural, uh, predator prey, um, ecosystem there because they just really that's not how these fish would interact uh, again fish are not necessarily that intelligent they're go going off instinct and they see something that maybe maybe slightly larger than them or something unknown and they mm -hmm. assume that they're in danger because that's simply how they work so make sure you're providing a nice comfortable tank experience for your fish if you're listening to this and you're not Juan you're listening to this and <laughs> you're going to start something new you're going to start a tank Start with just one species, something simple like a gobby or um, a, uh, man, I can't think of the word right now, but it's not goldfish. Goldfish are actually better fish? Uh, it, it, no, the better fish are hard too because they got to be okay. by themselves. It's it's a, the <laughs> gobbies and it's a type of minnow, but you don't say min minnows are like, it's not the right term. But just, you know what, <laughs> go to a store and ask somebody who knows what the heck they're talking about. Go to a store, ask somebody who knows what they're talking about. But there's great starter fish that you could use, and uh, you could keep it nice and simple. Uh, but check, check the environment. Make sure all the stats are nice. <laughs> and uh, thank you. That was Juan, right? Juan yeah, from thanks for the question. San Jose. Thanks and a lot. And thank you, for Chris, for question. answering the fish question for, so that I yeah, didn't I guess, have to. You know. Try, try I feel like for me, here. fish are like plants. Like I, I can't keep a plant alive and I don't know that I could keep fish alive. So uh, we've got a plant, uh, that is actually doing well. And it's the first time ever. It's just, it's a monstera, uh, oh, variant yeah. and mm -hmm. it's now growing another little stem. It's a second Aww. new stem that cool. is grown under our care. Uh, so we're feeling very accomplished over the, over the plant. Congratulations. Very, very accomplished. Um, but hey, listen, that's the end of our show. <laughs> Who would have thunk that we made it to the end of a show uh, yet again, another another Tuesday in the book. So if you're listening to this, hop into the social media comments, get involved in the conversation. We got Halloween coming up. We want to see we want to see pets in costumes. costumes. We want to see matching costumes between pets. We want to see <laughs> like a cat dad as Batman, cat as Robin. I want to see it, people. Uh, and if you are listening to the show, share it with a friend, give us a nice five-star review, uh, tell us all the wonderful things. Give us some nice compliments. I gobble those we up. Love nom, it. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> <laughs> and until next week, we will be coming up with some more great products and guests for you. So go. <laughs> So go. Sorry. So, so go. go. So go. So go. I mean, go. I'm sorry. It's at the end. I haven't eaten lunch. I'm getting my brains fried. Then I'll do the send off. As always, be kind to yourself and be kind <laughs> to your animals. And we will see you back here next Tuesday. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> go. <laughs> Just go. Pets add life. <laughs>